Hey guys, it is Melissa and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Melissa Ellen and I do true crime videos. My intention is to raise awareness on missing persons, unsolved cases, and things along those lines. So if you got a, you know, crazy fascination with true crime, then make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. And for those of you that have been on this journey with me that, you know, are really passionate about helping missing persons and raising awareness and on that part of it, I want to make sure I explain to you guys where I've been, what I have going on, and I'm going to talk about that at the end of the video. So if, you know, other people are not interested, so make sure you hit the subscribe button down below if you want to keep, good, good talk, if you want to keep hearing about true crime. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So today we're going to be talking about Bardstown, Kentucky. So. If you're familiar with this case, that's possible. There is a very long series on oxygen that was done about Bardstown. They cover a ton of unsolved cases there. Really shines on this city to just be like, what is going on? It doesn't make any sense. We're gonna cover four of the cases, kind of the four biggest cases that are pushing Bardstown into the limelight and trying to raise awareness on what's going on there. And there's also an unresolved podcast, has several episodes. It is really, really informative. That is done so well. I also watched uh, Grey Hughes covers, Lord Nards, Daniel Holland. That's chapter, what's chapter? I don't know. There's several others that cover here on YouTube and I'll make sure I link that down below for you as well. So this is a case that has been covered. And I do think that, you know, I feel I have some more information to add, but for those that are not familiar, I wanna talk about it. I want to make sure I say in the very beginning, for those of you that are already familiar, I'm well aware that these four cases might not be related. I'm well aware that they might be related. I feel that it is possible that it is part of a, a strategy, an idea to highlight these four fascinating cases to just overall raise awareness and get some help in Bardstown because something's not right. The FBI is involved, the Kentucky State Police Department is involved. So there is a lot of people working on these cases and it does appear that some of the initial investigation might've been where things got lost because these cases are unsolved. Uh, we're talking about 2013, 14, 15, 16 cases unsolved. These are huge, a shooting of an officer, a double homicide of a mother and daughter in their home, a missing mother of five, and her father being shot in a hunting accident. There's a ton. So we're going to go ahead and start out in 2013 with the Jason Ellis shooting. And I'm well aware that these cases may or may not be related. And we're going to talk about it. And you guys are going to give me your opinion. Okay. So that's what we're going to do today. So thank you guys so much for being here. And let's jump right into the video. Okay, we're going to start out in 2013 with the shooting death of Officer Jason Ellis. Now, Jason Ellis was an officer in the Bardstown Police Department, and he came on to the police department in 2006. Prior to that, he had lived in Cincinnati. He was uh, played baseball in high school. He played in college. He even went on to play in the minor leagues, uh, the Mustangs, the Cincinnati Reds minor league team. So he had quite a little bit of a career in the minor league baseball. In 2001, he met his wife, Amy. I believe it was on Valentine's Day. And then in 2004, they decided it was time to pursue the next part of their life. And they moved back to Amy's home state in Kentucky, and they moved to Bardstown. And in 2006, that's when he joined the police department. Now, they do have two sons, Hunter and Parker. And I do believe that it is Hunter who does suffer from Down syndrome. I literally only have to include that because it might be relevant later. Right? And it's like, you're like, why did you say that? This is why. Together, they're raising their two sons. And the typical routine is Jason was working overnight shifts at this time. He was a canine officer with his dog, Figo. He was a big part of the drug task force team. At this time, he's been on the police department for a couple years now. And so this is what he was doing. A typical routine. He worked the overnight shift. He drives home. Amy would have already put Hunter and Parker to bed. They were little kids. And then she normally would sleep on the couch. And Jason would come in the door, wake his wife up, and they would go to bed together. And unfortunately, on this night, literally an officer's wife's worst nightmare is instead of him coming through the door, there was a knock on the door and it was letting her know Jason had been traveling home. He got off of his shift around two o'clock in the morning and he was heading home. While in his police vehicle, he's on the Bluegrass Parkway, 
Bluegrass Parkway. This is going to come up a lot. Okay. So he's on the Bluegrass Parkway and he starts to exit 34. I'm going to make sure there's a picture of it coming up. So this has got a bend that comes around. So he gets part around the bend a little bit, like just a tiny bit. And there is debris in the roadway. There is not a picture of the debris. It seemed to me after I read later, it I thought at first it was like it was a big log, but now I'm getting the it wasn't that. It was debris. So, but there was a bunch of it in the roadway, sticks. And prior to him arriving, they found out later there was a car that went around it and left. Nothing happened to them. Maybe because they didn't stop, maybe because they went around, who knows? But it was enough that you could go around. Jason being an officer, being Jason, whatever it was. He didn't just ignore it. He stopped his police cruiser, blocked the roadway, and went and started picking up the debris to get rid of it. They figured out that he picked up some sticks or debris or whatever it was and had started to walk towards the side of the road, presumably to, you know, get rid of it. And he was shot multiple times with buckshot from a shotgun and he was pronounced, he died almost immediately. There wasn't even time. He never pulled his service revolver. There was absolutely no witnesses. So this has kind of been put together based on evidence. And about 10 to 15 minutes later, another vehicle drives by. From what I gather, it was a woman and her teenage son was driving her home. Officer down, officer down, Bluefield Road. Eventually, they do ask her, like, where are you at? She's telling them she's on the Bluegrass Parkway, and she ends up helping them, okay? So, bless this woman, because I've seen some comments just completely berating her, but she did the best she could. She grabbed that radio, and she's yelling officer down. It's silent. Nobody's responding. They're trying to figure out what's going on, and she gets police there. So, it is a very small police department. Officers arrive on scene. These are close friends of his. Um, it's said that the guy that arrived was a very close friend of his, a texting buddy, in fact. And when he arrived, they at first thought that Officer Ellis had been in some sort of an accident, maybe struck by a vehicle. Something had happened because he had just debris all over him. When they finally opened his bulletproof vest, they in fact found at that time that he had been shot. It was buckshot, so the shot sprays out. He had small bruises all over him, head, chest, arm, stomach, neck, everywhere, okay? And it did kill him immediately. So police immediately are trying to figure out what happened. Based on where this parkway is and based on where the turn is, it's very kind of guessing obvious that somebody was up on the ledge. Somebody went up on the ledge, they had a shotgun, and they were aiming it right there. They That debris was put in the middle of the road it was so obvious. This was also three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Now, it was a moonlight. It was stated by another officer when he arrived that it was lit up by the moon. So there was light in this area at this time because of the moonlight. But based on this information, this obviously was very premeditated. This person put this debris in the roadway, went up onto this ledge with a shotgun, aimed it down, and waited. Now, the question is, were they waiting for Officer Ellis? Is that possible? It is possible. This was his normal route home. It was stated by others. There are other routes, but this absolutely was the route he normally took and the quickest way home. This is the way he was going to get home. So it could be assumed that if somebody knew when he got off work and knew his route home, absolutely. It is important to know because he was a canine officer and of course you want to know where's Figo. Figo wasn't with him that on that night. Officer Ellis's main car that he normally drove, which was a canine equipped car, was in the shop. It was being repainted or something like that. I don't know if how long it was out. I saw somewhere it said that, that not a lot of people knew that he didn't have his car. A lot of assumptions there. It would have taken a very organized to specifically target Officer Ellis on that night, in that car, in that location. So maybe they were just waiting for any officer that came along to clean up the debris. Or maybe they were waiting for an accident. Maybe they were waiting for a tow truck driver. Who knows? But whoever it was was up there. And when they saw Officer Ellis, 
That's the person they chose to shoot at. They didn't wait for the next car that came and then shoot at them. They didn't shoot at the guy that went around. They only shot at Officer Ellis. A couple of things that I wanna add in before I move on to the next case. So, so Officer Jason Ellis was 33 at the time of his death. His canine dog was Figo. He'd had him for several years. And at his funeral on May 30th of 2013, Figo even, I saw this picture before, but Figo went up to his casket unprompted and put his paw onto the casket of Officer Ellis. I just thought it was really touching. Jason was also still a baseball coach. So he was coaching Little League Baseball, still very involved, really an all around family man. There was a lead that was looked into in regards to Officer Ellis. There is a gang, a bigger gang in Bartstown. They're called the BMG, the Big Money Bartstown Gang. I'm not getting involved. <laughs> I don't need them coming at me for making fun of their name. BMG, Big Money Bar Town Gang. Like, don't sound that badass. Anyways, that's just my idea. They're actually pretty much, I mean, they're a gang. They're not good people. They're scary. They do bad things. But they're a gang that, like, it doesn't seem that they are a gang that is organized enough to carry out such an orchestrated event, especially if you're considering them with any of the other things that happen later on. So there's also an interview with an officer who said that they interviewed the leader of the BMG and he was in prison at the time. And he, and I'm, I'm not saying that they always believe criminals, but they, they felt that they could, that they just don't find them viable. That they really believed him when he was like, look, we didn't do it. My people didn't do it. If my people didn't believe me, I would tell you, like, we're not involved. Like, get us out of this. And I guess they felt comfortable with that. It doesn't seem that that is, it doesn't seem like that went anywhere. So at this time, the shooting death of Officer Jason Ellis is unsolved. There's a $200,000 reward. If you know something, call. I'm sure you've got a friend that will call for you. Somebody will call for $200,000. In the United States, I believe the solve rate for police homicides is like over 95%. So this is very, very unusual. This is not solved. And there is a lot of pressure. And they have not given up the, as I said, the FBI, the Kentucky State Police Department is involved, as well as the Bardstown Police Department. But I'm sure they're outsourcing. So I will make sure that in the description box down below, there's all of the information for any tips or anonymous leads in the Jason Ellis case. So now we're going to talk about the double murder of Kathy and Samantha Netherland that took place inside of their home in Bardstown, Kentucky. Now this took place on April 21st of 2014. I always say I'm going to get those little tabs so that I can turn the pages back and forth and not mess everything up. I never do. Got it. Okay, so Kathy was 48 years old and Samantha was 16. Kathy was a special ed teacher. She had received a master's degree in special education. She worked in several of the different schools, but she was currently employed as a special education teacher at the Bardstown Elementary. Now, Samantha was 16 years old and a sophomore at Bardstown High School. She was all around known for a stellar student. One of those like really bright, smart, good grades, involved in the honor society, choir, like a really good girl. The one, you know, like I want my, my son to date, like that kind of good girl. And she was just really well liked, well loved. Kathy as well, like they were, like I went back and I was looking at Kathy Netherland's Facebook and she's just so so oh, loved her daughters. Now, unfortunately, Kathy had actually suffered a loss a year prior when her husband, Bob, had passed away of an illness. Now, Bob actually had worked with the Special Olympics for years, and Kathy worked with special education children. So these were just two really stellar people, and they raised two beautiful daughters. Samantha was 16, and she was attending high school. They had an older daughter by the name of Holly, and she was in her sophomore year of college. So just really good People, like, not, it matters. It does. I'm sorry. It just makes it so much harder when you hear about great people who are doing nothing but great in this life. Absolutely no involvement. Gangs, drugs, running away, bad people, like, literally nothing. They're not involved in anything like that. They can't find jack crap. There's not a crazy boyfriend. There's, 
There was even, I read, uh, it's Sherry Hubbard, which is the sister of Kathy Netherland. She has a Facebook group. It's called uh, Find That Car, and I'll explain why in a second. And she wrote on there, like, there was just one insane post that was like, I, so I'm hearing a rumor that my sister was having an affair before she was killed. That's great. I'd love to know more. First of all, she was a widow, so she wasn't having an affair. So, like, rumors in this town are horrible. Nothing. The Netherlands had nothing, nothing to explain what happened to them. On the morning of April 22nd of 2014, Kathy and Samantha did not show up for work and school. The schools talk to each other. They all know each other. Kathy and Samantha were stellar on attendance. They were not the kind of people that didn't show up. Like they called, they were there. I even saw where Samantha had like a long-standing, perfect attendance. Like this didn't happen for them not to show up and there were no phone calls. The school, knowing them, ended up contacting their Samantha's grandfather and saying, hey, can you go by the house and check on them? Like, they're not answering and they're not here. And unfortunately, he did go by and he did find them. And the scene still makes no sense. Samantha seemed to be the target of the attack, which makes no sense. Uh, she was bludgeoned severely in the head and her throat was slit. Her mother, Kathy, had been shot multiple times and her throat slit. I, literally shocking. Police have no leads. There's no evidence. The one thing I did just see, I was watching another video somebody posted, and they did mention that the perpetrator did go through the front door of the house, which was unusual because this house was kind of older, so it had settled and the front door was hard to open. So that's kind of unusual. But other than that, they have no idea no leads. They do believe it would have been two perpetrators at least because two women to be attacked in such a manner, you would think it took two people unless it was a ransack quick one person. We've seen that I think like in the Jamie Kloss case, that was insane. He took out three people in under five minutes. So it can happen. The only thing that police have been able to do at this point is that they have a surveillance video of a black Chevy Impala between the years of 2006 to 2013, and it is seen leaving the area at a high rate of speed, at a high rate of speed, and police are comfortable enough to say that they believe the killer or killers are in that vehicle. Unfortunately, you can't make out anything. They released some information about the vehicle, and I will refer you to the Facebook group called Find That Car because that is the focus of that group is to find that car because they do believe that that car is associated. I'm sorry. So I can see like the kids as they're getting out of school. My son gets out in about a half hour. So these are the younger kids. These are like third graders and low. And they run down the street as if they're being kidnapped. But it's the same little kids I see every day and they live three houses down. So I know they're like almost going to be like, I'm going to get my snack. I bet they're fighting over who's going to play a video game. But I see them every day, so I was watching, like, what's going on? They're fine. Now, this actually took place in the community of Botland, which is in Nelson County and right next to Bardstown. But they, the reason they're able to figure out that that is probably that car is that car is seen at a high rate of speed, leaving that community and headed back towards Bardstown. And they're traveling on the US 150 at this time. So that's all they have so far. Come around. My kid is on. You wore your shirt today? Come look, look what I'm wearing. Come here, show your shirt. Say hi. Hello. He had on a sweatshirt this morning. I didn't even notice he was wearing his shirt too. So we'll talk about the shirts at the end of the video. All right, I'm recording my video. So as you would have seen from Kathy's Facebook, Samantha was getting ready to go to prom. They were actually really excited. There's Facebook posts about it. There's text messages between the mom and the aunt talking about the prom dress. So excited. She was a really dedicated mom. And so they ended up actually doing her funeral on her prom night. And she wore her prom dress in the casket. I can't even imagine how hard that was. So at this time, I believe, and I was trying to make sure, but it looks like the reward is at $50,000 at least for the case of the Netherlands. And I encourage you, if you know anything in that area, all the information is down below. This is brutal. And there is not a chance in hell that somebody doesn't know. So there's a reward. Come forward. I know you're wondering why we went from the shooting death to the 
double homicide. And the thing is, is that it's because these are two organized, orchestrated murders, seemingly completely unrelated in a small town one year apart. There were rumors that Kathy Netherland might have taught Hunter Ellis, the son of Officer Ellis, and I believe it was Hunter. I'm sorry, I shouldn't even say a name because I'm not sure which son it was and I just don't feel like I need to research that. But there was a rumor that she might have taught the son of Officer Ellis that has Down syndrome. That is 100% just a rumor. On the Facebook group, Find That Car, Kathy's sister said, absolutely not. She did not know Officer Ellis. She has no relation to them. They did not know. She, they, there is no relation. Samantha didn't babysit her kids. Didn't babysit the kids we're going to talk about next. Like, literally, she feels that there's no relationship between Officer Ellis and Kathy Netherland. And at this point, it doesn't appear there are. But what you have is very organized crimes a year apart in a small town that has an incredibly low murder crime rate. So that's what we have so far. Now we're going to talk about the next year in 2015 when a mother of five, Crystal Rogers, vanished. Literally vanished into thin air. Okay, the disappearance of Crystal Rogers actually has a ton more info that helps the case or maybe is the reason the case didn't get solved because it jacked it all up, one or the other. But there's a lot of information. So let me give you a little bit of background. Crystal was 35 years old. She had five kids. She had two boys and three girls. Now, from what I gather, one of the boys is Eli, and he's about two and a half to three years old when this happened, and his father is is Crystal's boyfriend, Brooks Houck, okay? So Crystal and Brooks have been dating for about three or four years, and they have a son, Eli, who's about two and a half to three years old. Crystal has four older children. Three of those children are with her ex-husband, who is Keith Rogers. Technically, not her ex-husband. They weren't together anymore. They were separated, but they never, (laughs) like I know this story, but they hadn't actually finished their divorce. So Crystal and Brooks are living together. Crystal used to work at a gas station. She babysat occasionally, but her main job that she was doing and had been doing for a long time is she was helping Brooks out with his rental business. So he owned a bunch of rental properties. Brooks seemed to be doing pretty well off. There is, in interviews, he owned his family's farm that he had bought when it got passed down. He owned all these rental companies, and he would go around and maintain them and take care of them. He also had equipment out at his family's farm for maintaining these houses. So it seemed like he had his hands on a lot of different businesses and seemed to be doing pretty well for himself. So when Crystal met Brooks, her family was actually pretty good with this. The thing is, is that Crystal just didn't really have very good luck with relationships. She'd obviously been separated from her ex-husband. There is another father of the oldest child, which I believe is a girl. And it appears that it's just she didn't have good luck with men, okay? So she meets Brooks. He's doing well financially. He's going to provide for her. And they are going to run this business. And, like, life seems good, After going through everything, I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't find that there was a lot of massive issues between Brooks and Crystal, even between the friends, even between the family. What I gathered is that Brooks, okay, he's in his 30s. He doesn't have any other children. He has money. He's got these businesses. He seems like he's probably a little rigid. The fights that they were having had to do with him being more attentive and loving to their son and kind of treating the older kids disrespectful. We also have teenage daughters. There was arguments over cell phones. There just seemed to be, I totally like literally see this scenario and he might've been a total asshole. She might've been, you know, unwilling to help him out. Who knows what the situation was? What I can say is that it that actually didn't seem like it was massive. Like it, it just seemed like something was starting to become an issue. They probably were gonna end up breaking up over this. He makes a couple remarks when he's interviewed in the interrogation where, like, they're talking about, does Crystal ever disappear for days at a time? And he says something about she goes to these, like, fantasy parties with her friends and he watches the kids. And the way he says it, he's like, oh, I'm good enough to watch the kids. But, you know, when things go down, they're going to throw me under the bus. It was like a weird inserted statement randomly 
So it's very clear that there were some issues. She He also makes reference to her sister and friend and refers to them. He's referring to another lady as being a mature woman, not like them. So he obviously didn't care for her friends. I'm getting the feeling that he thought he was more superior. He thought he was better. He thought he was amazing. He just thought he knew everything. I mean, that's kind of the, get it? Like maybe a narcissist, but I'm not a professional, so I'm not going to diagnose him. But that's kind of the sense I'm getting. So I didn't see anything in their past that anybody would have expected for them this to happen but for them to break up totally made sense her sister said that a couple days prior to her going missing that she had made a comment that yeah she was going to get a job and she was moving out she was leaving him so totally seems like what was happening honestly it really really does so how does she go missing okay july 3rd of 2015 this is a friday she is seen at a walmart that day she has interactions with people and she arrives home around 5.30. Brooks ends up getting there. Her boyfriend, Eli, the baby's there. And her oldest daughter is there. The oldest daughter is waiting for her paternal grandmother to come pick her up. And she's leaving. Now, there's some confusion. Because Crystal sends a text message to a friend that says, because the friend is asking her, like, go do something at Chuck E. Cheese or something. And she's like, no, I can't. Um, we're getting a babysitter date night. So the friend assumed that meant the older kids were going to be gone because they're gone on the weekends. They have a father that they go to. The older daughter has a grandmother she goes to, so they're gone. And so she thought, oh, they're getting a babysitter for Eli. But they did not get a babysitter for Eli. Like, that didn't happen. When Brooks is asked about it, he says that sometimes they would tell the older children they were getting a babysitter so that they wouldn't be jealous. So it would make sense if... The older daughter that was at home, if she said, oh, yeah, no, they got a babysitter for Eli, then he could have said, no, 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 we just told her we did, but we really didn't. But the thing was is that that's not what happened. Crystal texted her friend saying they were getting a babysitter. They were never getting a babysitter. So why would Crystal tell her friend? Why wouldn't Crystal just tell her friend, like, oh, no, we're taking Eli out to the farm um, to hang out for the night. Maybe she didn't want her friend. She didn't want to tell her friend no, so she made up an excuse. Kind of weird. I tell your friend, it's your friend. Like, no, no, we're doing date night. Whatever. So, what happened is, is that around seven o'clock, Eli, the two and a half, three year old, Brooks, the boyfriend, and Crystal jump into Brooks' truck and they take off to go to the family farm, which is about 20 minutes away. So, this is a huge farm with multiple buildings. The mother lives there. Brooks' mother lives there. And this is Brooks' family farm. Uh, he has access to it. His mom does. Family does. His brother does. A big, huge farm. It's got lakes. It's got a ton. So this is somewhere that they go out to. And, like, they can drive down the road and go out to the lake, go to the barn. They don't always stop at the main house. So on this night, according to Brooks, the, the plan was to go out to the farm and just kind of play around out there. They were going to feed the cows some sweet feed, which is, like, they just put it in a big old bin. They feed the cows. Then they were going to take a walk out to the lake area. The thing that is interesting to know is they did not get out there until about 7.20 p.m. This is according to surveillance that is on at the beginning of the farm from the Brooks aunt's home. There's multiple houses. So according to surveillance, they pulled in around 7.20. They're there for about 20, 30 minutes. Brooks then leaves, gets to the inn, stops, turns around, and comes back. According to Brooks, when the investigators asked him during his interrogation, you know, why did you leave? Oh, I left and because I was going to go get more feed at the feed store, at the tractor supply. But then after I started driving, I realized they're probably closed. And so I turned around and came back. Unimportant, not important, who knows? The thing to know is that that's weird. He goes to the tractor supply store. He knows this store. So, like, he should have known whether or not they were open. Okay, but maybe not. You just randomly want feed. Like, you got when you go before. Or don't you have feed? I mean, they still fed the cow. So, what, did he need the feed right then? Or was he just like, hey, I should go get it? Anyways. So, he says that's what he did. And then he came back. And they're there. And he says that they went on a walk down the lake and back. Now, according to him, this walk to the lake is almost a mile and then a walk back. That's kind of a lot for a two and a half, three-year-old. 
But I know that some kids are that used to being outdoors that they would go that far. It's also a lot considering that by now this is like nine o'clock at night. And according to her mother, Crystal's mother, it was raining that night too. But I, I don't know. So that, that's weird. But that being said, we're outdoorsy. We used to live up in the mountains. This would be totally normal to us. We wouldn't care. We would be sitting out at nine o'clock at night climbing up the trees like it didn't matter. So I get it. Maybe all things are possible. So according to Brooks, uh, they leave the farm. Uh, he thought it was closer to 11. It ends up it's closer to like 1130. And they end up getting home close to midnight. And according to him, he can't recall if they ate, when they ate. He can't really remember what else they did out there. At some point in time, a fire was burned that night. But during the interrogation, the thing is, he can't remember anything. We'll get to that in a second, okay? Said he normally burns fires out there, so. Ooh, this is so frustrating. Okay, so let's go back. So according to him, they get home around midnight, and he goes straight to bed. And that Eli doesn't go to bed because Eli is a late a night owl kid and that he and Crystal normally stay up late and they normally sleep in in the morning. So to him, this was not abnormal. Crystal was sitting on the couch playing a game on her phone. Eli was running around. He went to bed. He said he awakes in the morning. We figure this out around six or seven, according to phone calls he received. And according to him, Eli is now in the bed next to him. He gets up and Crystal's gone gone literally gone she's not there her car is gone her purse is gone her phone's gone she's gone so what does he do he got up he got dressed he took a shower he got Eli in the car at some point in time he does make a phone call to Crystal I'd like to tell you where he was when he made the phone call but he said he can't remember he just knows at some point in time he called her that day just some time that morning he called her I'm sure there are phone records, but I have not seen the actual time of any phone calls he made to her. I just know from the interrogations that he said he called her sometime that morning. Just, you know, couldn't even tell you where he was. He was asked things to try to help him remember, you know, like things like, so what did you have for breakfast that morning? What about Eli? Did Eli have breakfast that morning? And he's like, and he goes into this like extended details about like, yeah, I'm sure he did. And then he talks all about these like yogurt squeeze things. He buys them and they've got vitamins and nutrients and he's sure he fed him and he's sure he had it and he knows he ate that. Like all of these like really long details. And then they're like, okay, so cool. Where were you when you called Crystal? I don't remember. His interview was an hour and 45 minutes. It starts out with him spending five full minutes in detail explaining all of these business contacts, his properties, his location, the family farm, he is breaking it down. Like he came in prepared. Uh, he's going to tell him who his CPA is. He's going to tell him anything he wants to know. So it seems like, okay, cool. There's just pages that he's put together for them to outline everyone he knows, everything. And then they just ask him basic questions. So like when you woke up in the morning and realized your girlfriend's gone, did you call her? I don't, I don't remember when I called her. So eventually they realize that on Saturday morning, he wakes up, he gets ready, he gets Eli in the truck, and they go back out to the farm. While they're out at the farm, he doesn't know what he did. But, well, he kind of does. He knows that there was a dozer that was in front of the barn, and something about the slab was off, so water was draining, so they he needed to move the dozer to a new spot. <laughs> When I tell you, again, because now we're on facts, now we're on details and facts, the long stories that he's telling about this barn being off and his mom doesn't like the trash, so she gets annoyed, so he moves things around. He doesn't want to pay high rates at the landfill, so he always has trash, so he burns it off, so he doesn't have to take so much level. Like, these are things that make sense, okay? And I, that's what it feels like. It feels like when they ask him a question that's too specific, he relies on everything that would make sense. Like, yeah, it would make total sense. You move the bulldozer over. Okay, cool. And he's talking about he's got a, a tractor and then he's got a broken tractor piece. Okay, I mean, like, I don't know what that had to do with the question, what did you do Saturday morning? And then he's going on about the landfill rates and 
Okay, I get it. So you do burn. Okay, I think he's just trying to make it sense why there's a burn pile because he already knows that police have been out there taking apart that burn pile and look through that burn pile. So the minute they're bringing up Saturday morning and the dozer, anything around this burn pile, he starts just vomit of the mouth. We used to talk about this when I was in sales back in the day and you'd ever go to a salesperson and you ask them like, hey, so tell me about that camera and they like word vomit they just can't shut up <laughs> they talk themselves out that's what he's doing it's just word vomit like he won't stop and so he's telling them that he basically doesn't really remember what he did Saturday morning but he knows he moved the dozer and so they're trying to ask him like so you're on a, a bulldozer and of course I asked my boyfriend because he runs big equipment and I'm like so like would you operate the bulldozer if our two-year-old grandson was running around he's like no you can't do that and I'm like Really? He said, okay. The only thing he would say is that, like, yes, if our grandson had been living on the property with us and was completely familiar and they were far enough away on their little tricycles, he might move it a little bit, but, like, that's really weird. And when questioned, Brooks says all the time, I don't use the equipment. I don't use the equipment. I don't I don't use the equipment. But then he's talking about, but when he does use the equipment, he, like, rides with him or... And so they're just... they're. They're trying to ask him the question. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We're not talking about your parenting. We're not talking about normally, what do you do? How do you parent? Where do you put your kid? We're asking you, Saturday morning, you got in the bulldozer and you moved it. Where was he like? Well, normally what he does is he has like five or six toys that he plays around on. And they're like, he's blah, 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 blah. Like, okay. But on Saturday morning, where was he like? Well, normally he'd be, and he, you, we never actually get the, he never actually says, on Saturday morning, I went to my farm with Eli, I took the bulldozer, I moved it over because of some leaking, and Eli was playing on the slab of concrete far away from me on the toys. Like, they push for 20 minutes for him just to answer this question, and he never really technically answers that. He tells you what would normally happen. Well, normally when I'm out there, this is what would happen. They're even asking him, like, so did you see your mom on Friday night or Saturday morning at the farm? Well, I don't normally see her. Sometimes she parks her car inside. Sometimes she parks outside. And they're just like, great, here we go again. They're like, no, no, no. On Friday or Saturday, did you see your mom? Like, she said she was mowing the grass on one of those days. Did you see her mom? Yeah, she's always outside. She's more outside than she inside. Again, he never really answers the question because he just keeps saying, I don't know. This is what normally happens. I need to be very clear. She disappeared on July 3rd. This interview is being done on July 8th. Five days after his girlfriend that he has a child with disappeared from their home and they do not have major problems in their relationship. He is asked very clearly, why are you not worried? According to him according to Brooks and Brooks only, that this is something she's done before, that when they get in a fight, sometimes she'll take off. So now you're like, wait, hold on, there was a fight? Exactly. So police are like, wait, so was there a fight? Oh, we had an argument. We had an argument over the fact that Crystal thinks that he treats Eli better than the other children. I have to take a break and I will be right back. Okay, I apologize. I had to leave for just a little bit and go get the kids from school. Thought I would be done recording. I wasn't, so I'm almost done. Any, anyway, not really. <laughs> we got a little bit to go, guys. So we were talking about the disappearance of Crystal Rogers, and we were talking about the interview that her boyfriend Brooks did, and we've, we've covered a little bit. So let me just give you a timeline of what happened in this case. So the last time she was seen was on July 3rd. She was spotted at a Walmart, and then she was seen by her daughter at home, and then it is reported that she went with Brooks out to the farm. She has never seen or heard from again. It is reported by Brooks that they came home around midnight, she's on her phone, and she, he wakes up in the morning, and she's gone. The next day is the 4th of July. Her children, the older children, had plans already with other family members. And so it is only her and Eli and Brooks on this day, and they have plans to attend a large, a very large 4th of July gathering at a family member of Brooks' house. And so he wakes up that morning. She's gone at some point. He doesn't know when. He calls her. And then he goes out to the farm. He's doing stuff out there with Eli. 
He then eventually remembers, well, he doesn't say for sure, but he said, I must have went home to take a shower. They're like, well, did you? Well, I must have. I assume I did. Of course I did. I was at the farm. So, of course, I went home and took a shower. But then it comes out that he rode to the family gathering with his mother. So, he must have gone home, took a shower, and then come back, which is crazy because this interview took place on July 8th. This is events that happened on July 4th, and he literally cannot tell them for sure they kind of piece it together that they know that he went to the farm that day and they know that he drove with his mother to the event they were at the event for a couple of hours they left before dark uh so they didn't stay for fireworks while at the event um they were asked like hey so like did did people ask where crystal was according to him he said he did call her on the way there she didn't answer and so he just assumed like okay that's weird I guess she's not coming home from being mad at me which is something she doesn't do but according to him she has so it's weird he says that nobody there asked about crystal I find it weird like your mother you rode with your mother and your mother didn't say hey so where's crystal hey Eli where's your mommy doesn't happen like nobody asked him he said that the people at the party were kind of extended family members so that they didn't really know crystal they hadn't really met her very often so it wasn't unusual that not a single soul asked him where his girlfriend was or where the child's mother is according to him nobody asked it see it's just it doesn't make sense but he tries to make it make sense. Like, he he worked so hard on the backstory. Like, yeah, it makes sense. Like, they didn't know her, so, like, it didn't come up. No way. No way that not a single, your mother that you rode in the car with didn't ask, where's Crystal? You guys, because he can't say, like, yeah, my mom asked where Crystal was. And I said, oh, I don't know where she's at. Because her mom would have been like, um, that's really weird. Why have you called her mother? Did you call her kids? Did you call her friends? Like, you need to start calling people. That's crazy. Is she missing? Is something wrong? That didn't happen. And then according to him, he goes home, doesn't do anything, um, is just at home. He mentions that his neighbor may probably came by because that's what he does, but he doesn't say he did for sure because he doesn't know. He cannot remember anything. He doesn't remember when he got home. He doesn't remember what they had for dinner. And the detective points it out really good. He said, look, it's not weird to not remember what time you had dinner. Or maybe not to remember exactly what you ate. But it is weird to not remember if you ate. And this is a couple of days prior. And he's a meticulous person. He's got meticulous notes about everything except for anything that matters. Just really got to point it out. Because I know a lot of you are not going to go watch this almost two-hour interrogation. It's weird. So on July 5th, that morning, he gets up. Again, doesn't know what time, doesn't really know what he's doing. But at some point in time, he does run into Sherry, which is Crystal Rogers' mother. Now, Sherry is like, hey, what's going on? Where's Crystal? I can't find her. Apparently, the older daughter had been trying to get a hold of her mother because she wanted different clothes. The mother's not responding. So then she's calling her grandma. And grandma's like, I'll get a hold of your mom. But then mom's not answering. So by Sunday, the mom kind of ignored the fact that she hadn't heard from her on the 4th of July because she's thinking, well, maybe she's busy with the 4th of July. Eli, she's not paying attention. Like, okay, maybe one day of her daughter not responding. But then when she hadn't heard from the next day, she's like, nope, police department. Like, something's not right. She runs into Brooks. Like, I guess they're driving small town. He's, like, near the Walmart. They pull over. And she's like, "Um, where's my daughter? And he's like, yeah, I don't know. And then she sees that Eli's in the car. And she said for her, she knew instantly instantly that meant something's wrong crystal wouldn't be gone for two days without her son like this doesn't make any sense this wasn't like she was gone for an hour she was gone for a day and a half at this point so this was very very worrisome to her and she reported her missing her vehicle was discovered later on that afternoon and it was parked on the bluegrass parkway and when they found the vehicle it uh, it would appear this is the state of the vehicle it was like pulled over to the side. It had a flat tire. The keys were in the ignition. Her purse was in the car. Her cell phone was in the car. Her makeup was in the car, kind of strewn around, all in the car. So it would appear as if she got a flat tire and then got out of her vehicle to inspect it and something happened to her. I'm going to give you this info now. There were bloodhounds brought into her vehicle. 
the bloodhounds could not pick up her scent outside of the vehicle. It was as if she never got out of the vehicle at that scene. She would have had to literally like a car would have had to pull up and she would have had to jump into the next window and never touch the outside or ground of the vehicle. The bloodhounds were tested. They were taken to another location. I believe the home. And then it led. Anyways, the bloodhounds could pick up her scent very clearly. Knew where they were going without direction. They followed her scent. But they could not follow it at the vehicle. And that leads them to believe that she was never at the vehicle at that scene. It looks like the vehicle was staged and dropped. There are reports from vehicle that... From vehicle? There are reports from people that they had seen that vehicle on the side of the Bluegrass Parkway Saturday. And then there were people that said, absolutely not. It was not there on Saturday. It showed up on Sunday. We don't know. We don't know when the vehicle got there. They're really unclear. It has never been fully determined what day the vehicle showed up abandoned on the Bluegrass Parkway. So that is on July 5th when her vehicle is discovered. So police do go out to the scene. They go out to the home. They have Brooks in. They're asking him questions. They go to his own. They're asking questions. But this is all like preliminary. So his first full sit down interrogation happened on July 8th. Three days later. Okay. She was reported missing on Sunday. And now this is Wednesday afternoon. Like this is how quick this was. This is Wednesday afternoon. He's already annoyed that so much is being, he's having to give so much information, having to come in. He's not like mean or rude about it. I've seen people be shitty, but he's already kind of like, this is a lot. Like, I don't understand. Like, just move on. Why are you looking at me? I don't have anything to say. I don't know anything. I don't know. So during the July 8th interview, I have to give you this before I give you the rest. During that interview, towards the end, it's about a seven o'clock at night, Brooks gets a phone call during the interview and he asks if he can answer. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> of course, they want to see what he's going to say. On the other end of the line was Officer Nick Hoke. And this is Brooks' brother. Okay. So his brother is an officer with the Bardstown Police Department. He knows that he is in the middle of an interview at the Bardstown Police Department. Now, the gentleman who's interviewing him is detective john snow and he is actually with the with the kentucky sheriff's office so a little bit like it's not a bardstown detective but like it's happening in bardstown at this tiny little bardstown police department so he knows that he's being interviewed he comes out later he finally admits well yeah his brother had called him before he went in there so he knew he was being interviewed but he won't quite say when he called him it's another two hours of i don't know i don't remember can't recall don't know don't know when did your brother call you to tell you he was being interrogated? Don't know. They ask him, Nick, your brother, your brother, who he literally, up until like two weeks prior, lived like right down the road from him. And like, remember, they have this big family farm that they're always on. He tries to say that like, basically him and his brother don't talk. Like, they just don't talk. But they see each other all the time, but they don't talk. Like, they don't have any conversations. Like, they're just not that close. They're just not that way. They're both so busy in their lives that like, they don't talk. And so he's like, so when did you find out your brother's girlfriend was missing? Don't know. Well, how did you find out? I don't know. Well, did somebody call you? Don't know. Did you see it online? I don't know. You know, it's all over Facebook. It's all over the news. Everyone's talking about it. Okay, cool. Who's the first person who told you that your, like, sister-in-law basically is missing? I don't know. Don't remember. <laughs> like, it, this is crazy. Because... Nick is interviewed because now, okay, so he called his brother during the interview and he's telling his brother, he says he's telling his brother basically to cooperate, but you can hear that he's yelling on the other end. I'm going to insert it for you guys. You know, no. I'm up, I'm up here. I know that you didn't know I'm up here in this interview with um, the detective, Detective Snow. I've been up here a good little while. I'm, I'm filling out this uh, this statement here and everything. Do, is it, do, are you telling me that's are you telling me that's what I need to do? I know I don't, I know I, I know I, I know that, but 
the way that I look at it is I, I'm innocent. I ain't done nothing wrong. Well, you know, I know you told me innocent people got jammed up, but if you're telling me to leave, I'll get up and leave. If you want me, if you want me to. I know I'm going through a lot, but I'm trying to get this guy to help me. I don't think she, I don't think she's ran off with some other guy. I don't, I don't believe that. You can't make me think that. No. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, I mean, so, so do I. I'll do exactly what you're telling me to do right now. Do you want me to get up and leave? Man, I don't think these guys, I don't, I don't think these people are not as vindictive just to, to skin me for no reason. Man, look, this is not their family. This is not. All right, thank you. He thinks y'all will fuck is what he thinks. I don't know who he is. Nick, my brother. He you just, know you're no, I, I know that, but I, I'm not. He just said just to just to keep sitting up here to get a, give a statement, do an interview, whatever I got to do, do it. But he said, no, just to keep just letting them just beat you to death over this right here. Just ask what you got to ask, and let me you know. I, uh, and you tell me. You see what I'm? You see what I mean? He knows more about this than I do. You see? And, and have I listen? Have I told you that I'm for you? Yes, you have. I said, what did I say? My job is to find Crystal, right? That's so you've seen that and how it, it, it just seems rehearsed. It seems scheduled. It seems like Brooks is just saying stuff, but that's not, it doesn't seem like it matches the conversation, but that's just a judgment call. A lot of people felt like it was rehearsed. Mm -hmm. He was trying to make himself look innocent by saying these things. Who knows? Either way, Nick absolutely should not have made that phone call. He should not have interfered in an investigation by contacting his brother. And then, fine, so you did. So then they're like, so when did you talk to your brother? I don't remember. When did your brother tell you he was going for the interrogation? I don't remember. He says that he called because he was not fond of Detective Snow personally as a detective and he didn't trust him. And so he just wanted to give his brother a heads up. So then, when Nick is finally interviewed, when was Nick interviewed? He was subpoenaed to the grand jury on the 9th, so the next day, and he refuses. And then his interview took place on, on the 10th. The chief of the police department is telling Nick, like, hey, you need to come in and get interviewed. So they're telling him, they call him up. They're like, hey, come in for an interview. And he's like, yeah, I don't have anything to say. They're like, okay, well, you still have to come in. Like, we need an interview. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. The grand jury tries to, he's like, no, I don't have anything to say. And his police chief has to like tell him like, you don't have a choice. You're a police officer and you're gonna need to cooperate. Like, this is what we do. You're gonna need to come in. So eventually they actually go to his house and take his police cruiser. So then he comes in, they take his police cruiser and they go through it. And then he comes in and they actually do his interview on July 15th. So when they do his interview, that's when he's saying, I don't know anything. I don't know. He won't even answer questions like, when's the last time you talked to your brother? I don't remember. What have you and your brother talked about? I don't remember. Has your brother brought up his missing girlfriend to you? Yeah. I mean, yeah, but no, we don't really talk about it. I don't want to interrogate him. He's <laughs> fall. He's like, sorry. He's like, I don't want to interrogate him. I don't want to get involved. And it's like things that make sense. So like if you were to say... I'm not going to bug my brother too much about what's going on because I am a police officer and I don't want to get myself in a situation. That would make sense. But then you would, then you'd be like, okay, so I talked to my brother yesterday around noon. I just asked him how he was feeling, but I didn't ask him anything about the case, but I asked him if he was okay or anything like that. But he's like, yeah, I don't remember. Like, did, did, did you ask him how he was doing? I don't remember. Did, did you? It's, weird it's so awkward he literally is just like and they're like we're asking about something that happened involving your missing brother your brother's missing girlfriend hello i don't remember i don't recall as if it was 70 years ago so while in there they ask him to do a polygraph and um he kind of has no choice 
And he says that, yeah, he would do when he picks a date of July 20th. They call him on July 20th. They're like, um, where are you? And he's like, yeah, I'm off duty, so I'm not coming in. This pissed them off because he chose the date. And then he doesn't come. Finally, he does um, get the polygraph because they make him go in and do the polygraph. And then the FBI polygraph comes back. And uh, Chief McCubbin was like, um, yeah, I have grave concerns over the results of your polygraph was the exact quote. So he failed it. And, and he they call him on it and he gets pissed. He's like, you're calling me an effing liar. I don't like that. And they're like, he's, the polygraph examiner is awesome. He's like, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just telling you. So you've been untruthful. And um, let's talk about why you're being untruthful. What happened? And Nick is flipping out. He's like, I'm not a liar. Why are you saying this? And he's like, yeah. I mean, like, okay, but you are. I mean, it's proven. We're past. We are past it. It's okay. So now tell me what happened. And Nick won't back. He's pissed. He's annoyed. He will not admit to anything. And it ends at that um he has to be told to cooperate and finally on october 16th of 2015 nick is fired from the bardstown police department and it is cited the exact reason hold on i like this quote of why they said why nick did not meet the criteria to be a police officer that he did not withhold to the basic standards of what a police officer stands for. So they didn't even have to do basic facts. Like he doesn't, you are impeding investigation when we are required to lead investigations. And if you can't even assist, but instead you're actually trying to harm an investigation, you're not meant to be a police officer. That And so they fired him and he's terminated. So let me give you a couple of things from the interview before I go on with anything further. I will say this, and one of the things that came up in the interview for those that were curious, so obviously it does not, 100% does not seem like Crystal walked away from her life. She didn't have the means to. She did not have any other relationships that they found. And she had children. She loved and adored and would not walk away from. So that didn't seem to be, there were questions about like her mental state was anything, an option for her marriage herself. And even Brooks was like, no, she 100% was not that person. Everyone said, nope, 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 nope. She was not that kind of person. There was also, here's another thing. On the night of the third, so the night that Crystal is last known to be with Brooks, in the truck, they go to the farm, they come back. Around midnight, Brooks received a phone call that only lasted 13 seconds. And they had to figure out who the phone call was from because, like, I don't know. I don't remember. Like, you don't remember getting a phone call at midnight on the night of the fourth. You don't remember a phone call at midnight. No, I don't remember. I, I'm a very busy person. So they figured out that it was a guy by the name of Steve Lawson. He calls Steve Lawson while in the interrogation. He's like, hey, Steve. Talks to him for a second. He's like, hey, by the way, I was trying to remember. Oh, why did you call me Friday night? And he's like, oh, yeah, I remember why I called you. I wanted those phone numbers for those houses because remember, he does rental houses. And you told me that you were going to call Crystal and get those numbers and you'd call me back. He's like, okay, thanks. Bye. Ends the phone call with this guy. Like, okay, fine. Okay, cool, cool. I'll get back to you. So then he kind of leans by the chair and the guy's like, I only have one question. So that guy called you around midnight. According to the timeline, you guys are in your truck driving home. Crystal's right next to you. Why do you need to call her? He never answers the question. He goes into, he doesn't say specific. He says, well, usually. Well, Crystal, you know, I mean, normally she wouldn't want to take a phone call that late. I wouldn't want to, you know, bother her. You know, sometimes Eli goes to sleep in the truck. And, you know, sometimes I don't even look at the phone sometimes. I probably just answered it without thinking. And, you know, normally, usually this is how, well, do you get where I'm going? Like, he never actually answers. He gives all of these excuses and reasons around, but never actually answers the question like, oh, I don't want to talk to that guy that night. Or uh, Crystal was asleep. Or... Crystal doesn't like him or nothing. She, he's just like, usually she doesn't want to deal with it. But if she's literally right there in the car next to you, why would you make the phrase, I have to call Crystal to get those numbers and I'll get back to you. And then he never gets back to the guy. And he can't remember the phone call. How are you going to do business like that? And you don't remember having phone calls with people who want to do business with you to get phone numbers. And then you don't even remember. The during the interrogation, so I'm going to list that for you guys. The July 8th interrogation, if you want to see the phone call with the brother, which I played for you guys, that starts at about one hour 45 minutes in. 
And then the phone, the interview ends up ending afterwards because he keeps saying like, well, if you want me to walk out of here, that's what I'll do. But the ends and the detectives like, I mean, like you can leave if you want, but like I'm done anyways. I was just going to tell you what we're doing next. Like if you want to get it, you can leave anytime you want. Like we're just gathering information still. So July 15th was the interview that Nick Hauk did on, and that's the officer brother of Brooks. And so in his interview, he was asked questions like, do you, you know, how well do you know Crystal? And he basically is like, yeah, I don't know. I, I see her around town. Like, I I don't really know her. I've never really, like, couldn't even say, like, I don't know her that well. She seems sweet. She seems nice. She's quiet. She's loud. She's bubbly. She's out. Nothing. She's like, mm, I don't really know. I don't really know her. Don't really know her. They ask him, like, you know, like, does your brother talk about her? Not really. Don't really know her. Don't know anything. Later on, he says that he does admit that his brother has complained to him about Crystal complaining that Brooks was nicer to the little baby of theirs than he was the older kids. So your brother does talk to you. He said he barely sees his brother. Sometimes he would borrow tools from him um, because the brother owns the property management business. Well, that's what Nick also does. But Brooks has been doing it longer and has more equipment. So he would borrow. But he said now he doesn't even really borrow anything from him. So he just doesn't really talk to him, doesn't see him. He sees him like on the farm, but they don't really talk. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> he couldn't even recall the last time he had ever seen Crystal. Couldn't recall when he found out she was missing doesn't talk to anybody about the fact that she's missing, says that he doesn't find it weird that his brother Brooks didn't call him, even though he works for the Bardstown Police Department as a police officer, that he didn't find it weird that his brother wouldn't call him to say like, hey, my girlfriend's missing. What should I do? He's like, oh, no, that's, no, we don't really talk. Now, this is where they started to talk about Officer Nick's police cruiser. So when they brought in the police cruiser, there were a couple things that were concerning. He is the second owner of that vehicle, but he has owned it for years. So he's been in that vehicle. Um, he's been on the police department. He's been on with the Bardstown Police Department since 2007. So just so we're clear, Officer Jason Ellis that we talked about at the beginning, he was shot and killed in 2013. Officer Nick and Officer Jason both worked that night shift in 2013 when this happened. So I know that because during the interrogation, he makes mention that he used to be on the 4 to 2 a.m. shift with Officer Jason Ellis. They ask him very clearly, Officer Nick, like, so, hey, do you and your brother meet at the farm? And he's like, no, we just run into each other. We don't really set up. And the reason they get to this, because on July 8th, when Brooks had that interview and then his brother called him, as soon as they were done with the interview, him and his brother met at the farm. They say, no, no, we didn't. I don't remember seeing him. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know. I don't remember what I was doing there. I don't remember what he did. I don't remember going there. This is like a week and a half prior. He's like, I don't remember. I don't remember going there. I don't, I don't remember anything. I, sorry. There's video camera of literally Brooks pulls up, Nick pulls up behind him, and they drive onto the farm together. At like in 20. Sorry, I don't have the time they arrived. They arrive at the farm at the same time and follow each other in and then they are both seen leaving at 11 30. in fact it shows officer nick pull up stop at the end back up and then both cars leave together so like no that could be a coincidence but like your cars arrived together and left together you met each other out there and so they're like did you meet no just just must have been my accident coincidence well, do you remember seeing him? No. Do you remember being there? No, I don't really remember going. I don't remember what I did. Did you see your mom? I don't know. What were you doing out there? I don't know. I, it, absolutely freaking crazy. Remember, this interview is on July 15th. This was on July 8th. Don't know. And they're like, police are like, this is bullshit. Like, something's wrong here. Yeah, how do you not know? Neither one of them could really give an answer what they were doing out there why they met each other, what they were doing. They absolutely were just like, don't know, don't remember. Because you can't argue, say someone's lying, and they just say, I don't remember. Two more things about Officer Nick. So on July 10th, okay, so two days after the interview where they had met out at the farm, Keith Rogers, which is Crystal's estranged ex-husband, estranged, not strange, estranged, like meaning they're separated but not legally divorced. So Keith Rogers is at Brooks and Crystal's home on July 10th. He is there to get clothing 
for his children because now obviously their mother is missing. So he's over there and he's getting all of these clothes. And he said that Brooks got a phone call from his brother, Nick, looked at his mother. So Brooks's mother was there at the house too, looked at his mother and said, we have to go. Nick needs us. They were seen by a neighbor moving items out to the back of Nick's police cruiser and putting them into Brooks's mother's vehicle or a vehicle. When asked about this, I don't know. They're like, well, did you ever call your brother? I don't think so. I don't know. Did your mother, did you ever call your mother and you needed help? I don't know. I don't think so. They're like, did you need help with anything? I don't think so. I don't remember. Not that I recall. I, I don't know. Well, did you ever take anything out of your police cruiser and put it into your mother? Not that I recall. Not that I recall. I don't recall. It's so bad. It's like, what was that, um, what was that case where they were interviewed and they pled the fifth? I think it was like 50 times in a row or something. What is my brain thinking of right now? Something political. I don't remember. Now, in the back of his police cruiser, there were a couple things to be concerned. They went through the vehicle. The first thing is there's a missing fire extinguisher. They don't know if that means anything. Uh, it could have been left at a scene, but this is a really small town. Like when they're talking to him about, hey, is there any chance you could have like, um, you know, blood or bodily fluids in your trunk? And he's like, absolutely not. They're like, you don't haul evidence. He's like, not really. And they're like, when's the last time anything could have gotten into the back of your trunk? And he's like, maybe at an accident scene, but like that's been a long time. So this isn't a police department that is dealing with accidents and suspects on a daily basis. Little less crime is happening. So he was pretty sure that there's not a chance in the world that he would have any sort of biological material in his trunk. He also could not explain why his fire extinguisher was missing. He was pretty sure that it was in there. I don't know for sure, but there was a blanket in there. Now this is a blanket that he says, very, very clearly. Remember, Mr. I don't know. He got this blanket from the barn on his mother's property, but I got it after the disappearance of Crystal. I, I know for sure I got it after Crystal was reported missing. I got that blanket. Okay, well, that's not true. Because they go back and they're tracing it back. And he said he was using the blanket to move a couple weeks prior. And that was because he was moving from the house that was near his brother to a new house. So they're like, well, if you were moving a couple weeks ago, then did you get the blanket a couple weeks ago? Oh, I totally doesn't remember anymore. Can't remember. Can't remember when I got the blanket. I don't know. I don't know. He said that he had the blanket. There was a stack of blankets at in this barn. He picked one of them, took that blanket to his house to wrap like your TV and stuff in while moving in his truck. And then he put the blanket back in his police cruiser to take back to the barn. You don't have blankets at home? But maybe he called it a moving blanket. So maybe it was one of those really thick blankets you have out at a barn. Um, so, okay, maybe, but so weird. And I wouldn't really care except for it was determined there is bodily fluids on that blanket and in his trunk. The only thing I can figure out, guys, and I tried to dig in because I didn't want to say I don't know on this one because it's so important. But please, if you know a little more than I do, would you comment below? What I gathered is that the material is some sort of bodily fluid. So we could be talking urine, vomit, blood, all kinds of anything, okay? They know that it is some sort of fluid and they know that it is in the trunk and that it is on the blanket and that the what is on the trunk and what is on the blanket match each other, but that that's all they know. They, they can't determine where it came from, whose it is, or anything like that. And that is the only information I could find. But, of course, he's like, no, not possible. Don't know. I don't know. At the time that they interviewed him, I don't think that they knew anything further than that there was some material. Because that's all they say. They say that they sprayed it with luminol. It lit up like Chernobyl. And why? And he's like, I don't know. At this point, I think as police officers and in an officer's trunk, I don't know that they knew for sure that I think they kind of assumed it was probably something to do with police activity and I think they expected him to say blah 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 but he's just like I don't know I think that's what was worse rather than him saying like yeah I handle materials all the time there's all kinds of stuff in my trunk it could be anything I don't know I don't know 
He did definitely did not need to be a police officer. I also thought it was in, interesting, by the way. They asked him, like, hey, you know, do you have your phone? Do you mind if we copy it? And he's like, yeah, I don't care. And they're like, okay, cool. Can we have it? He's like, I left it at home. You left your cell phone at home? You left your cell phone at home. Who leaves their cell phone at home? But anyways, that was just a side note. So at this point, it literally went nowhere. There is... Brooks Houck has been named. So on October 16th, when they announced that they had fired Officer Nick Houck from the police department, I say Houck and Hook. It's Houck. And when he was fired, they named Brooks as the main suspect in Crystal Rogers' disappearance. And they made it very clear that they do not believe she's alive. And I think it's just truly sad to say out loud, but they do not believe there's a chance in the world that she's out there. They believe that somebody caused her harm and removed her in such a way that they can't find her. Since then, there was a... Detective Snow did an update on October 11th of 2018. And they had done, at that time, over 70 search warrants. They had the state police lab, the FBI Quantico lab, private labs, everything. They had assisted when the oxygen series came out, when they, you know, tried to pull more evidence from the vehicle, just trying to be helpful. They took that evidence. They tested it. The police department has went through multiple changes in Bardstown. I believe four different, at least four different police chiefs, um, at least eight officers stepped down from the police department pretty quickly after this happened. It's been a big stir up. And so they've had these cases that they're trying to figure out, like, what is going on? So two big things happened in 2016 trying to advance this case. The white sides are members of Brooks' family, and I don't want to get too far into them. But basically, it came out later that there was a possibility that on the night of the 3rd, when Crystal went missing and they were out at the farm, that there might have been a white car or truck parked next to the barn in a weird spot. They did realize that um, the grandmother owned a Buick similar. So they wanted to bring the grandmother in to question her. She pled the fifth. The lawyer says that it is not because she's guilty. It's because they feel that this case is starting to involve too many people and people are starting to get implicated and that the 80 year old grandmother was, didn't want to be involved and she wasn't, so she didn't want to go in. But my understanding is if you plead the fifth, it has to be because of self-incrimination. It can't be, I don't want to be involved. You can just go up there and refuse to answer, but you can't plead the fifth. I don't know what it, they, she didn't give any information. Okay. They wanted to know about the vehicle. It had recently been sold. They're saying that it was possibly cleaned and sold and used for transportation of Crystal Rogers' body or something belonging to her. Nothing ever came from that. They have done multiple search warrants. There is a belief, I heard this on one of the series, that they might have had the ability to make their own weapons um, or ammunition. Uh, this old farm, old equipment. They've got a lot. These are hunters and farmers, and they have access to a lot of this information or a lot of these tools. So they were trying to, they've done all these search warrants trying to get more information. They've searched her house. They've searched Nick's house, Brooke's house, Brooke's mom's house. All Everything has been searched. They've searched and searched and searched. There are burn piles on this site, and the bloodhounds did hit on this burn pile. They've been unable to find anything. I don't know. So it makes me wonder to be like really brutal. Um, based on the equipment that he did have there, there's a lot that could have been done to get rid of her body and bring it down to a very small amount of body. And I know they, you know, they could try to hide that in the dirt and the soil and the location and the property. Ooh. Um, but it's just going to be found then. Even if it is down to nothing left, there's always something. And so they're not giving up. They're searching. They keep going out there. They keep trying to find her. The biggest push in finding Crystal Rogers was her father, Tommy Ballard. Tommy 
was relentless. He did not give up on his daughter. There were billboards everywhere, signs in everyone's yard, solve these murders, help find Crystal. People wanted Crystal found. Her dad was on the TV. He really, really, really was the driving force in finding out what happened to Crystal. And he was not giving up. A year later, on, I know this is like every year, on November 19th of 2016, Tommy Ballard took his 11-year-old grandson out onto their private property to go hunting. This is something they've done. This is his private property, or the family's private property. According to the family, they've never seen any other trespassers on their property. And they went out to go shooting, and Tommy was shot directly in the chest. According to investigators, they feel that this shot was on the money. This was a skilled marksman shot based on the distance and location. I don't know if that's fact or if that's an opinion. There also is an opinion that there appears to be a brush area off Bluegrass Parkway where you can see in and where somebody could have continuously been going by to see if Tommy was on the property and could have easily pulled over and shot him from that location. This was initially considered a hunting accident. This happens, unfortunately. However, in this case, no one ever came forward. They could have not came forward because they were on private property and they got scared, especially if they know about this case. Maybe they got scared. But this would be like, they would have been the perfect time to come forward in an accidental shooting because this would have been the time where people would have been happy to accept, not happy that he's gone, but that's not awful, happy to allow this to be an accidental shooting because what they don't want it to be is what they think that it is. And they absolutely feel that he was murdered. It has been ruled a death investigation and the Kentucky Police Sheriff's Department is handling that investigation with the FBI, which is something they don't normally do in hunting accidents, but this is considered a death investigation and they are looking into it. That was 2016. Sherry said from the moment she got the call, she knew that this was not an accident. This was always a murder and she really truly feels that Tommy was getting close to finding out what was happening in Bardstown. He was getting close to finding out what happen with crystal so that is kind of where everything is at the theory of how these cases could all be connected there's a couple of crazy ones and please by all means let's talk about them below i try to be a little careful about what kind of if it's too out there i don't want to put it into a video where it becomes permanent and i can't erase it out if it's offensive or completely wrong okay so we'll talk about crazy theories below but the biggest theory that's been talked about in the news is that BMG, the Big Money Bardstown gang, that they, theories and speculation, I'm not saying this is fact, that maybe they had some sort of like drug trade thing going on that maybe Officer Nick, Brooks' brother, knew or was covering or something and that Jason, Officer Jason Ellis was working on the same shift and that maybe he was interfering so they took him out and then maybe Nick was talking to Brooks about it and maybe Crystal heard, so he had to get rid of Crystal. And then her dad was getting too close, so then they had to take him out. So, like, maybe this all has to do, it might not even be the BMG. Maybe it's just them. Maybe they just have a corrupt group of cops or a corrupt farmers. I don't know. Maybe it, it couldn't be just anybody. But, like, maybe there's some sort of weird, like, money drug thing going on and that Nick and Brooks were involved and that that's how Jason got killed because maybe he was getting too close. Maybe he was involved. I've never heard anything like that. Most likely he was just getting too close. And then Crystal, maybe she found out or didn't like it or saw something maybe at the farm. And then her father got too close. So there's all these great theories. Where do the Netherlands fit in? I don't know. I don't know at all. But I know that it's just... An insane crime that happened in this town in between these crimes that keep happening. And there's others if you watch the Oxygen series. So, is that a lot, guys? I don't know how long this video is going to be because um, I started this morning. <laughs> and, I've, and I've had to come back over and over. So, I don't know how long this video is going to be. I Usually, I have an idea. 
I'm excited to see what your guys' thoughts are down below. What are your theories? What have you heard? Is this the craziest thing? Should I cover the other ones that were done on the Oxygen series? Do you think these are related at all? Do you think this is just like a hype in order to get attention to the town? I'm all for it. You guys know, if you haven't watched my channel long enough, I am all for anything that draws attention to solving cases. So whatever you need to do, if we need to link these cases in order to get attention to the missing mom, to the unsolved murders, by all means, let's do it. So that's my opinion. I will come back. There will be an update on this case and I will make sure I get it for you guys when it comes out. So thank you guys again so much for watching my video. I love you. I say this at the end of all of my videos. We're not at the end though. Hug your babies, hug your loves. Life is literally precious. Enjoy every minute of every day, and I will see you in my next video. But I did say that I would give you guys a little bit of an update on where I've been and what we have going on. So in 2019, we did really well. I think we did almost 50 videos, 40 something. Uh, we had a lot of success. There's like over 5,000 of you guys have joined my channel. I appreciate you. Those that have followed me know that my intention 100% is to try to do some sort of nonprofit, um, maybe join one, maybe start one. Maybe, I don't know yet, but that's my plan and that's what I'm working on. And I've been really absent for the last couple of months and I just want to apologize to you guys. I appreciate everything you guys do for me and I love the people that are just here for the salacious, crazy cases and just want to hear. I'm all for that too. And then I really appreciate my people that want the same thing. They want to help on these cases. They want to like try to, you know, bring awareness. And I, and I love that. And so I, for those people that kind of want to understand what's been going on, if you follow me on social media, I posted it. Um, but in the end of last year, my mother became really sick. She'd already been sick for a very long time. And we had been struggling with that. I, I mentioned it here and there in videos. Um, but September, October, we realized my mom was a lot sicker than we realized. Um, she had cancer. That wasn't even a concern. That's how sick my mom was. And so things just got really sick. We had to move her from nursing homes, just trying to get her the best care, trying to save her. And that's what we were trying to do. And eventually in January, my mother and my stepdad came to my home and my mom was put on hospice and my mom passed away in the end of January. I don't, I don't, I don't want to cry. I don't. I think I'm all cried out. And um, recently I've just been giggling and laughing. At, I know I say tear, but um, I don't know if you've ever watched my videos in the past, then you guys know that like, I don't know how I feel about like ghostly experiences and paranormal and stuff. I've had these like really funky things happen. Um, but I not like, I've never really had an experience. And so everyone in my life is having all these experiences. I mean, my stepdad woke up on my couch and was like, thought he saw my mom sitting in the chair and he's like hey grandma <laughs> and I'm like you're crazy but I because I just don't know and so I'm having experiences I know I am yesterday I went to film to edit this video and I filmed the day before and I wasn't really happy with it and I knew I wasn't happy with it and I was like it's fine I'll fix it in editing like I'll fix and I went I went to put on this necklace that has my mom's ashes in it. I'm sorry, guys. I'm like, I went to put on this necklace that has my mom's ashes in it. And um, it fell all over my floor. Like, all over my floor. <laughs> this was like my nightmare when we talked about getting necklaces um, because I that was my, my fear. You know what I mean? It's me. I drop everything. I break everything. Like, don't give me my mom in a trinket. I will break her. <laughs> So I did. I dropped it on the floor and I'm only laughing because that is my mom. Like a hundred percent, she would have died laughing at me, even though it's like a sad moment. Like, it's so me. It's so my mom. And I literally I called Ricky and I'm just like, my mom's on the floor. And, you know, of course he's worried about me. And once I'm like, then I just start laughing because I'm like, oh my God, like, my mom's on the freaking floor. What do I do? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to pick her up. Like, do I scoop her? Do I sweep her? Do I vacuum her? He's like, oh my God, don't vacuum her mom. And he's just like, it just had to laugh. And he's like, so um, what'd you do? And I'm like, so I just scooped her up. I didn't want to feel the ashes. I didn't want to know what they felt like. I just scooped her. Just, just, 
am I really telling YouTube that I scooped my mom off the floor? But I did. So I like scoop her and I like put her back in. And I got out all the little dust bunnies and I put her in and I sealed her up and she's just on my fireplace in her. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I just, <sighs> she's with me. That I know. But the thing was, is that I had decided, um, just a personal thing, and I had talked to my mom about this, is that I was not going to put out videos I wasn't proud of anymore. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care if anyone gets mad at me, and I don't care if anyone says, like, just make the video, just put it up. No, absolutely not. These are not challenge videos. These are not goofy videos. These are not Q&As. These are missing persons, and it's important that I do the right thing at the right time. So, do I have a posting schedule yet? No. <laughs> because I don't trust myself yet to follow it. Things are getting better. We've had more deaths in my family since, unfortunately. My stepfather was really ill. He was actually taken by ambulance when my mom was going on to hospice. He checked him out, AMA, came home to try to be with her, and an ambulance had to come get him. He was an AFib. I had to take him for a procedure. Like, there's been a lot. <laughs> but um, I smile because I have to be grateful. I have to be grateful that I have my family, and I had, you know, my mom my whole life. I've been very fortunate to have her in my life. And so I just have to be grateful for the good things in life. And that's where I've been. No, I don't have a posting schedule, but I'm working on it. And that is a goal in 2020. I will set a posting schedule because that seems to be really, like, people enjoy that. I know I do. I love knowing when my favorite YouTuber, what day they post on. And um, I'd like to work my way to being somebody's favorite YouTuber. So that's what we're going to work on. Thank you, guys, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for the loving things that you said about my mom. Um my mom was definitely somebody that did not like a lot of attention at all whatsoever. And so it's been really nice to give her this moment of recognition and love that she would not normally want because <laughs> she's such a not that person. And so I'm happy to do that for her. So I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. And um, I'm glad I've done this and said this part. So now we can make our videos. I love you guys and I'll see you in my next video.